Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. This was the speech delivered by John F. Kennedy, the President of the United States at the time. It was 1962, during the time of the United States-Soviet Union Cold War, and it had just been discovered that the Soviet Union had been secretly putting medium-range interballistic missiles in Cuba. Although Cuba claimed the missiles were only defensive, it was clear that the reason for the missiles was for the Soviet Union to have nuclear strike capabilities in the Western Hemisphere, especially against the United States. In October of 1962, a US U-2 spy plane saw and took pictures of these missiles. It was clear that the situation was urgent and required immediate action. President Kennedy created the group known as XCOM, the Executive Committee of the National Security Council, to discuss the situation and decide what course of action to follow. The XCOM group consisted of military and political leaders, including President John F. Kennedy, Vice President Lyndon Johnson, Dean Rusk, the Secretary of State, Robert Kennedy, the Attorney General, and John McCone, the Director of the CIA, just to name a few. Considering the power and influence of each member in the group gathered in just a few days, it's fair to say that the Cuban Missile Crisis was a situation of huge national importance. To take a closer look into the Cuban Missile Crisis, we have to first look back to the Cold War. In 1947, at the end of World War II, the Cold War began. It was caused by the ongoing rivalry of the United States and the Soviet Union. The United States supported capitalism and the Soviets supported communism, and both sides wanted their ways to spread. This created a lot of tension, which was only added to by the threat of nuclear weapons. After the US had dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in World War II, the world saw the destruction and power of their weapons, and the Soviets were concerned the US weapon arsenal could be a threat to them as well. As a result of this fear, the Soviets developed nuclear weapons of their own to match those possessed by the United States. This is very important at the peak of the Cold War, the Cuban Missile Crisis. In 1961, the US put more than 100 nuclear warheads in Turkey in striking distance from Moscow. The Soviets responded later in 1962 by putting their own missiles in Cuba, which was in striking distance from the United States. The Bay of Pigs invasion was another contributor to the Cuban Missile Crisis. After the intense Cuban Revolution, Fidel Castro became the head of the army. Eventually, Castro became the Prime Minister. As Prime Minister, Castro largely ran the country and started censoring the press, executing political opponents, and even banning full political parties. During this time, Dwight D. Eisenhower was the President of the United States, and he called out Castro for being a communist and ordered the CIA to remove him from power and put a new government in Cuba. The United States decided to conduct an invasion on the island, but they wanted to hide their involvement, so they trained 1,500 Cuban exiles in Florida in 1960, who had fled due to per political persecution. Due to term limits, though, this plan could not be carried out by Eisenhower. But when Kennedy was elected, he approved the plan. What he didn't know is that it would end horribly and all of the exiles would be killed or captured. The plan failed for two main reasons. First, it relied on natives to rise up against Castro, which didn't happen because the natives actually liked him. And second, because the US airstrike was canceled last minute and the invaders didn't have any support. On April 17, 1961, as soon as the main group made land, they came under intense fire. The Cuban Air Force destroyed most ships carrying meds and ammunition, and 25,000 Cuban soldiers then attacked the now poorly equipped invaders, and all were killed or captured within a few days. But the worst part of the incident was the response from Castro. After the incident, Castro turned to the Soviets to equip them with weapons to defend themselves from future attacks, and the Soviets happily supplied them with anything they wanted. 
This would eventually turn into the Soviets supplying Cuba with nuclear weapons. Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet premier, and Fidel Castro, the Cuban prime minister, had been undergoing secret negotiations. And in October of 1962, the Soviet Union sent nuclear missiles into Cuba. When the US U-2 spy plane saw and observed these missiles, it was clear that action had to be taken immediately. President John F. Kennedy brought together the group known as XCOM to discuss the possible strategic options in order to counter the threat. During the first XCOM meeting on October 16, 1962, the majority of the group favored an airstrike on the island in an attempt to destroy the nuclear sites. But the minority, including President John F. Kennedy, favored a safer diplomatic plan that would avoid direct conflict. On October 22, 1962, President John F. Kennedy ordered a quarantine on Cuba that would not let any ships with missiles in. They made sure to label it as a quarantine, because a blockade is officially an act of war. They argued there is a difference between the two, because a blockade blocks all trade and travel, but they were only restricting offensive weapon buildup. U.S. Navy ships were positioned around Cuba, and all ships wanting to go into Cuba were checked for offensive weapons. With this in place, ships carrying nuclear weapons were turned around, and no additional weapons made it into Cuba. During this time, President Kennedy gave his famous speech, informing the nation about the situation. All ships that did contain nuclear weapons obediently followed the orders of the U.S. Navy and turned around. This was a very positive sign that the Cuban Missile Crisis could be solved without war, but it didn't solve the problems of the existing missiles in Cuba. Due to meetings between Anatoly Dobrynin, the Russian ambassador, and Robert Kennedy, the Soviets knew the United States were desperate for the missiles to leave Cuba. On October 26th, Khrushchev sent a letter to Kennedy stating he would be willing to remove the missiles in Cuba under two conditions. First, the assurance that the United States would not invade Cuba, and second, for the quarantine to end. On October 27th, Khrushchev sent a second letter, adding one more condition. He wanted the United States Jupiter missiles out of Turkey. Kennedy was faced with an ultimatum. He could choose to allow the missiles to stay in Cuba, an obvious threat to the nation, or have them removed, but also lose a valuable asset in the missiles in Turkey. At the same time though, he didn't want to seem like he was negotiating with communists. Kennedy accepted the terms for the first letter, but did not mention the missiles in Turkey. After fear of escalation, though, he secretly agreed to take out the Jupiter missiles in Turkey as part of the arrangement. On October 28, 1962, the deal was finalized and the crisis concluded. Soviet missiles would be removed from Cuba under UN supervision, and the United States promised not to invade Cuba. Secretly, though, the U.S. missiles in Turkey would also have to be removed within the next six months. The diplomacy in the Cuban Missile Crisis saved the world from nuclear war. But how did Kennedy know that he had to avoid war at all costs? Kennedy himself was a World War II veteran, and his experience in the military heavily influenced his decision-making during the Cuban Missile Crisis. He joined the military in 1941 and worked his way up the ranks to become a lieutenant. On one mission during his time in the Navy, his boat was hit by a Japanese destroyer, and a few members of the crew were thrown overboard. He heroically dove in and rescued the two people, but he was devastated because he couldn't save two others who had been killed in the incident. His brother, Joseph Kennedy, had also been killed on duty when his plane was shot down. Due to these events, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, he was cautious to avoid war at all costs, and it was this that led to the crisis being solved diplomatically. Although many of his advisors, who had not personally seen the atrocities of war, thought an invasion would be best, he used his knowledge to not settle for the easy option, but to look for what would save lives. Due to his composure during a time of crisis, he found a diplomatic solution rather than a military one. He set an example that not every conflict has to end in war, and that human life should always be the first priority. The Cuban Missile Crisis also led to the creation of the hotline between the White House and Moscow to ensure easy communication in future crises. The Cuban Missile Crisis also paved the way for the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty to ensure the spread of nuclear weapons is contained. Mankind must put an end to war, or war will put an end to mankind. <laughs>